Hey there boys and girls of the YouTube world. Today I'm going to give you a quick walk around of a 65 Impala Supersport barn find I guess. Been sitting in a building for five years. We're going to see if we can't get it running. guy that had the barn that was storing it for the family let's just say he didn't want cameras in the yard so here we are on the countryside gorgeous North Dakota there's a fawn over there but he bounded away anyway here it is 65 Impala Super Sport two owner car factory white black vinyl top 327 power glide as with all super sports, bucket seats, console shift. I think they all had tachometers too. Add on air conditioning, tilt wheel, power windows. That's pretty swanky. Does have seat belts. It's gonna need a little bit of cleaning, but overall, pretty dang nice car. Looks like 11,000, so I'm guessing 111,000 miles. Allegedly never been painted, but. That looks like overspray to me. Maybe it's wax. I don't know. Looks like a little bit of rust starting to show through there. The vinyl top's kind of lifting up. I guess they had that redone at one time. That's pretty common for them to pull up there. Factory Super Sport hubcaps. Factory 14 inch wheels. Tires look pretty old. A couple of blims in the paint here. Dual exhaust. Five's got the three round tail lights. Six has got the one big long rectangular tail light. I think that's add on as well. Oh yeah, she's been painted around. Tighten that up so we don't lose it on the ride home. Looks like the vinyl top's lifting up a little bit there too. A little bit of overspray on that. Yeah, definitely repainted, but still a nice car. Might be a little bit of mud in the quarters. Oh yeah, she's cracking out there a bit as well. Wing window is open. We should probably close that before we bring her to town. Looks like there might have been some smell in here from a mouse. Awesome, huh? So they put some baking soda in there to try to get rid of that. Yeah, white with a black vinyl roof. Interesting color combination. Overall, pretty sweet car. Like I said, been off the road for about five years. So hopefully it don't take too much to get her going. What do you say, Duff? Should we head back to town? This thing ripping. Duffy and I made it back with the old Super Sport. It was about a 25 mile drive. Not too far from home. Maybe it was closer to 30, but five miles of gravel. Then uh, two lane, all the way back here to the shop. So I think what we're gonna do is give her a once over just to kind of check everything out, check fluids, whatnot, make sure there's not any major issues. And then I'm sure the battery's shot, because like I said, it's been sitting four or five years, something like that. And then we're probably going to unhook the fuel tank, crank it over for a bit, see if everything's good there, got spark and whatnot. And then we'll probably hook up an auxiliary tank and see if we can't get her to light up if we got spark. We got keys. Let's check that. Keys are in it. Can we figure out how to get the hood open on these? The 64s are right there. Nope. Oh, money. Yeah, definitely been repainted. Well, number 14. Like I said, uh, add-on ACs. So there's the add-on condenser. Oh, it's got the York style compressor. Mopar stuff. Looks like the engine's probably been out and painted up. Power brakes. Single reservoir fruit jar master cylinder. Power steering, short water pump. Got a little spacer on the fan. Looks like the AC, I'm guessing, oh, the compressor does turn. So maybe there's a chance that that would work again. Side post battery. We'll see if that'll come back to life. Not betting on it, but round up the battery here. Antifreeze. Ooh, a little bit of rust in there. Clean that out. But it does have some green coolant in there. Oh, look at how they wired in the AC. Wire nut. He was an electrician. So coolant, that's good. Oh, my favorite, flexi hose. At least it's a new one, if they're any better than old ones. Well, it's 
it's not at full. She's about a half quart, maybe a quart down, but good enough to get it going. Well, look at these fancy orange plug wire. Holy long. Oh yeah, they're supposed to run down underneath the ram horns, but they just looped them over the top, good enough. What a nice guy, even labeled which cylinder they go to. Opti clean bottles missing. I guess I should have pushed the brake pedal while I was in there, but there's probably about a 4% chance there's any fluid in here. And I was right. Ooh, there was some on the cap though. We'll just put that back, pretend like we didn't see that. Carbonator. At least she's not stuck. Oh, look at that. JB welded the heat riser into the manifold. Real good. A little bit of mouse poopy on the engine and air compressor. Look at these. Belden silicone jacketed ignition cable. It's the good stuff. Way better than the red ones. Oh, shoot. She's a four barrel car. I forgot SS. Must have been a rebuilt carbonator at one time. Look at that. Let's. Apparently they didn't do a real good job rebuilding because they got the choke wired open. Perfect. Yeah, ram horn factory manifolds. Apparently when they swapped the engine, they failed to hook up the body ground. Nice work. I think we'll pull the fuel line off the fuel pump. Grab a different battery and throw in here for the time being. Crank her up. See what happens. Is that silicone on there? I tell you what, rebuild stuff these days cannot be trusted. I think we'll just crank it over. Maybe I'll get my push button so I can crank it over and see if I got spark. Because as you can see, I don't have any help. The only help I did have is sleeping behind the corner of the 53 over there. Duff! What the French? You going to help out with this project or what? Want to go for a ride? Jeez, you must be whipped. Didn't even perk up for rides. All right, went and found myself a side post interstate battery. Actually stole it out of the orange Ford. Got her in there. Everything's free of the fan. Let's see if she cranks over. Dome lights are on. That's a plus. Here we go. Oh, bad connection. All right, snugged them up on the battery cable. Dome lights on. See what happens. Sounds good. Got some compression. Hey, since we got the key on, we got it running for the freaking windows to work. Maybe that's why they parked it because the windows don't work. Well, that's dumb. Ugh, power windows. Hey, look, a clock. Squirrel. Isn't that nifty? Oh, it's manifold vacuum, not a tack. Son of a way off. Windsor. I like whiskey. Let's leave the key on and we'll hook up my pushy button under the hood so I can watch. Since you're no help, say hi to the people on YouTube. No, no. Yeah. And I hook my button up, I'll leave that switch on, and hopefully we'll get some spark coming out of the coil. Plan B. I hooked my button up for some reason. The starter turns, but it doesn't engage the Bendix. Turning backwards, it's on the positive. Whatever. Anyway, well, I wonder if the mice chewed that off if they're just that deteriorated. We're just gonna take the distributor cap off, keys on. We'll just flick the points manually. Because if we don't have spark, that's more than likely what it is, is the points anyway. Yeah, a little corrosion inside the cap. That could probably be replaced. I suppose we better take the rotor off to get a little bit better accessibility to the points. The rotor doesn't look all that corroded. It almost looks like mice have been chewing on it, but there's no way they could get into there. Pushings are a little sloppy on the weights. Should work for what we gotta do. Well, we got juice to it. Ouch! Yeah, definitely got juice. Flick those a few times, hopefully that's all we need to do. Just 
Put our rotor back on. If you forget those and you go to try to start something, they don't start. Don't ask me how I know. Or ask me how many times I've done it. It's usually pretty easy to troubleshoot though when you're looking for a tool and you see that rotor laying there. You know that's what you forgot. Usually I scratch that corrosion off, but I'm one-handed right now. I don't think that's gonna bother. Cap back in place. Wires all on. Give me the old forge a little sriracha here. Don't fall off. See what happens. Come on, Impala. Oh, she's trying. Well, I think it's safe to say that we got spark. We know we don't have fuel unless I keep dumping sriracha in there, so let's drain the tank. No DAC things, this is how you keep mice out of your car. Make sure you pick them up every year, otherwise they'll make a nest out of them the second year. So here's our fuel drain system. Got myself a chunk of just brand new 3 ace fuel line that's really garbage. Get the gates, get the good stuff. Anyway, got that hooked up to our steel fuel line coming up from the tank. Stuck in a five gallon bucket to be disposed of properly. How dare you! After we get this drained out. And the way we're gonna get her out of there, got myself a uh, Western South Dakota gas cap. We'll stick that up in there. Don't light it on fire, you people out east. That would be a bad idea. And then we stick our blowgun in there. Give her just a little bit of pressure. You don't want to give her too much. And disappointment. I wonder, this is not vented, so we put that on there, blow in the other end, should pressurize it, maybe that'll push the fuel out. You don't want to give her too much because you can hear the tank swelling up. Maybe she's just empty. I guess I never check the gauge, usually they're never right anyway. Red fuzzy dice. Doesn't everybody have black and white fuzzy dice? Either color combination? I think that would be the thing I would have on a black and white car. Fuel gauge says half, but it does not move. As a matter of fact, none of them move. I wonder if the gauges are related to the issue with the window switches. You guys watching that gauge, did it go down? Hmm. Well, let's try shooting some more wind up there, see what happens. There we go. Just had to give her a little bit more pressure. Definitely put your Marlboro out. Now you could use an electric pump, or you could pull the tank, or you could feed a hose in through the filler neck. A lot of ways to do it. This is the way that I found works best because it doesn't require much work. Blow gun and a. You wouldn't even need a chunk of hose, but I didn't want to spew gas all over my trailer and driveway. And whatnot. Yeah, you don't like gas on the driveway, do it tough. Now you're gonna want to keep an eye on this because I don't know, this tank could be 20 gallons. You don't want six gallons of gas on a five gallon bucket because then you get yourself a mess. Ask me how I know. <laughs> Our bucket has not overflowed yet. Wonder if it's out. Ooh, that stuff doesn't smell too terrible, but it's not too good. Mostly just pushing air right back out, so maybe. Maybe we got her all. Only about two gallons in there. That would be alright. One other thing to note is I put this clamp just hooked it on the steel line I didn't put a clamp on it so if I did put too much pressure in there hopefully it would just blow off the hose not hurt the tank or anything this method doesn't work very well if you've got a vented cap just pushes the air out the vent on the cap obviously 
So I think what we're going to do is we're going to cut this chunk of fuel line off to the length it needs to be, hook it up to the fuel pump. It had the clamp style band clamps, fuel line clamps, whatever, the original style ones that I don't really care for. Threw those away and we'll put a couple of worm gear style gates clamps on there. Should be good to go. If there's a little bit of fuel left in the tank, we'll just blend it off with some new stuff. Should be fine. Like I said, this stuff doesn't look all too terrible. So I think we'll be all right. And then we'll probably prime the carburetor and see what happens. Well, I put six gallons of gas in the tank. I was going to go ahead and prime the carburetor and light her off, but I figured before we get it warmed up, most poop smells terrible at room temperature, so when you get it hot, it doesn't smell any better. Let's go ahead and get rid of all that. Don't worry about it going in the carburetor. Not going to be an issue. Small black Chevy, they'll run on anything, including most poop. Always give your car a good blow job after it's been sitting for a long time. It'll appreciate it. You're a lot of help today again. All right, since we know we don't have fuel up to the pump, give her a little sriracha. Get her go whoop. I like to prime the carburetor. Saves on the battery and the starter and whatnot. Ooh. Those sound like glass bags, don't they? Or blown out mufflers. Give her another primage. Come on, baby. Oh, not gonna idle. Hey, look, I found the fuses. Fuel gauge didn't move. I don't know, there's something about filling the bowls. Maybe that's just on Holly's. Whatever. I think we got her. Not even that much crap shot out of the tailpipes. Third time's a charm, just like they say. Or was it three times? You people on the internet will never know, thanks to editing. Son of a biscuit. Oh, Texaco, how neat is that? How neat is that? I guess I wouldn't be overly surprised if that fuel pump was dried out and not pumping either. Decent enough. You definitely glass packs. Doesn't want to idle, imagine that. Since we know we got What's that smoke all about. Maybe give her a walk around, but we know we got oil and we got coolant. Not hearing any funny noises. Not seeing too much extreme smoke, so I think we'll just leave her run for a little bit. Damn it, that is a lot of smoke. Maybe we better go check that out. I wish it would just idle. Guess we could turn the idle screw up a hair. 
Lisa! Chuchin, pretty good. Let's turn that idle up. Where is it at? nice and cool. A little smoke coming from the engine bay. I did see that this carburetor was remanufactured on uh, January 15th of 09. It looks pretty clean after that, so I don't think it got many miles on it, and I'm sure it took a while for that thing to get there. So we better address this smoke situation. Uh, nothing coming out that tailpipe that tailpipe smoking pretty good what the French is going on absolutely no pressure is it hooked up oh yeah there's the that later. Let's try to keep that exhaust out of the inside. Yeah, it doesn't sound bad at all. Seems to be hitting on all it. No ticks, no knocks. Probably just a quick tune-up. Well, other than the smoking situation. I don't know how deep we're going to get into this one. Again, running it might come out of that. Might just be a Sticky ring. Seems like it could use an accelerator pump. That's a lot of smoke. Uh, I had my glass pack days. I guess I never really did. I thought they were cool, but I never had any. Thank goodness. <laughs> Sorry to all you rednecks who think that's cool. wasn't smoking because it'd be on to something. Power steering even feels good. Don't touch the brake though. We know that that's not going to be good. Yeah, the smoke is going to be an issue. What other kind of good stuff we got in here? Your uh, five wood for beating muskrats with. Easy air grill. Must be for the camper. This must have been the covers he was going to put on the seats. Let's see. Oh, shoot. Expired in 2013, so let's just say it's seven years off the road. Probably eight. Oh, look at that. That's the good remote. One for all. Big easy. Yeah, I met her once. No batteries. There's why the AC wasn't working. The, uh, Drain hose going onto the transmission wasn't hooked up here, so it's draining on their feet. They probably unhooked it. Maybe. Who knows? God, what a shame to cover up that sweet SSM one with the Windsor AC unit. I think we're gonna leave her run a bit and find some brake fluid. Oh, we need to check that tranny because there was a huge puddle on the shop floor where I picked this thing up. I'm guessing the front main seal is deteriorated to nothing. Probably shut it off and check that right now actually. Well, should probably cycle it in gear a few times and then check it. How about that? We're all chained down so we don't have to hit the brakes. Well, she tries to go in reverse, there must be some fluid in it. Got forward too. Let's leave her in neutral. Ah, we're gonna leave it in park. 
bad things happen to me when I leave things in neutral. Oh yeah, she needs a quart. Since the master cylinder is dry, there's clearly a leak in the brake system somewhere. I guess we could crawl underneath and try to find out where it is, but I'm just gonna top it off, pretend like it didn't happen, and hit the brake pedal. It'll have fixed it. Maybe we can turn the idle down now. And you know, all the fuel gauge is just about at E. Temps in the middle. That started way down low, so yeah, that might be working. It definitely needs an accelerator pump. Oh, that's a lot of smoke. And no brakes. Booster's working. You can even hear the engine stall hesitate just a hair when you push it. Yeah, no brakes. Can't say that I'm not surprised. Oh, hey, how neat is that? Watch the amp gauge when I push the brake pedal. Drop. It's because of all them six brake lights on the back of these things. Drop. All right, I'm having too much fun here. Let's see if she starts back up. Yeah. She needs some carb work for sure. Maybe there's just a trick to it. Radio? Oh yeah. Okay, enough of that. So we know we got a major exhaust issue on the right side. Muffler might just fix that. We got a lot of smoke. An oil. Oh, look at all that oil in my chain binder. You can see the outline of the trailer. A lot of smoke on the left bank. We got no brakes. We got no windows. We got a carburetor hesitation issue. Plus all your regular oil change tune up. Fluids, whatnot. And I would highly recommend putting some newer tires on it because I'm sure these are 25 years old. But it runs. So there's that. Definitely not my hardest challenge, but every one of them's different. They're fun. Doesn't matter how you get it done, as long as you're having fun, right? I don't know if I want to look at the brakes on the trailer or not. Did it go down any at least? Oh, it did. It did. Maybe I'll do some poking around underneath, see what we can see. That wheel looks dry. This one looks dry. Oh man, those hoses look old as hell. We're gonna do brakes, he's gonna get hoses. That wheel looks dry, as does that one. I don't know, maybe just adding fluid and hitting the brakes. She'll come back. Not a permanent fix, but get it so that we can drive it off the trailer anyway. Through the back wall here, 
camera's on, so should make some real good footage. So based on the squealing and skid marks, the right front brake is working. Just a bit aggressive though, so we're going to figure out what's going on there. We do have some brakes though, so that's a plus. Makes it a lot easier to move it around. Let's try to get them to work a little bit better. Alright, now that we got her up on stands, we crawl underneath. Take a look, see what we got going on. So I got my handy dandy, don't have any friends bleeder here. Just got a little Canada Dry bottle, thanks to AJ. Drill a hole in the lid. A little chunk of vacuum hose, just small enough to fit over the brake bleeder. Ooh, look, Monroe coilovers. Awesome. Look at that muffler. She's a little, uh, it's chewy. Why didn't they even tighten that clamp up? Slow down. Oh yeah, I'm an electrician. No worries. I hate those clamps. That hose is a little chewy too. Well, it does have a vent. I wonder if that's plugged up. Looks like the tank has been out because that's not factory rope. Oh man, it had a drain plug in it. Could have just pulled that. Tech tip of the day, I always check to see if there's a drain plug. It never is for me. Well, these are factory bent pipes. We could probably get a part number for that. Get a new one. Looks like it just needs a muffler though. And, and a hanger. Who hangs the hanger upside down like that? Man, there's some shady exhaust shops. Or mechanics, or vehicle owners. Anyway, there's our bleeder up there. We're gonna go ahead and crack or loose if we can. Make sure you always use a six point or a line wrench if you can. 12 points, round them off. Always start at the wheel furthest away from the master cylinder in pretty much all cases. That's the right rear for the stuff that I work on anyway. And then we have our hose onto the bleeder once you got her cracked open. Put a little bit of fluid in your Canadian dry and make sure that the hose is below the fluid level. That fluid's actually pretty clean, it's hard to tell in there, but now we'll go ahead and pump the pedal and it should push fluid out and then we'll come back here with a uh, 3 8 wrench, tighten that back up. And this will not only flush the system, but it'll bleed it too. And you don't need a friend to help you this way. Oh great, it's raining. Check my master cylinder up here, and it's dry. Did you guys see any bubbles back here? I think we'll try her again. Ran out of fluid up front. You don't want to do that. Looks like the bottle's a little more full. All right. The bottle is a little bit more full. And the theory with this is as you pump the brakes, it should be pulling fluid back up into the system and the air evacuates through that bottle because we're trying to get all the air out of the system. So I just kind of snug it up with our open end wrench and then tighten her up. Now, continue the process with the rest of the wheels. Come on. These are always sweet when they strip off or they're plugged up. 
The main key here is always make sure you got the reservoir on the master cylinder full. Because once that runs dry, you gotta do this air into the system. And then you start all back over again. So sometimes on some vehicles you can push the pedal with your hand, stick your head under the car, watch for air bubbles. That's what I did this time. I didn't see any air bubbles come out, which is concerning. And I also, when I cracked that bleeder, I didn't see any fluids. Maybe this wheel cylinder is not getting any fluids. I know the other one is because the bottle is quite a bit more full than when we started. And you can see how brown it's getting from the rusty fluid that's in the system. So I don't know if this line is pinched. It doesn't look like the chain pinched it. When we tied it down, maybe there's just crap in it or the wheel cylinder is stuck, hard to see. Well, the bleeder could be full of dirt too. Let's go to the front and see what happens up there. Look how clean these rockers are. Eh, there's a little mud there, just kidding. A little mud there too. Pinhole there. Why do body guys? Never fix underneath here. Really sand that off. Easy way to tell if the car's ever been worked on. Just run your finger along the bottom here when you're standing outside and you can tell. Paint sags there. Not good enough coverage on the bottom of the jams. Oh way. Yeah. Didn't get enough paint in the seams. It's weird. Because the frame look, looks like they taped it off and painted the frame black. Tempted to. Probably because the whole frame was white. Yep. Just picking stuff apart. <clears throat> like I said, this car's got a power glide, two speed, automatic. The later aluminum one, but it's got a leak. I'm guessing that silicone around that cover right there is related to it. Oh, yeah. Silicone the entire pan on. If you ever see silicone, it's never good. Never good idea to use the silicone. Oh, still got the old canister style oil filter on it. How neat is that? That's pretty neat. Looks like somebody put some newer shocks on her at one point. Last one. This frickin' go on there already. Now I suppose when I tip the bottle up. It'll come on out. Nope. We must move some fluid because uh, that master cylinder went that long. That was about six to eight pumps. Just snug her up with the open end of the box in wrench. And take your ratchet. Tighten her up. There you go. A lot of dirty brake fluid. So now, in theory, I should push on that pedal and it should feel firm. Odds? Ah, we got a 50 50 chance. Either it is or it isn't. It isn't. There it is. Leave her sit for a couple seconds. Not bad. Going all the way to the carpet. And then if you push them a few times, and if it gets hard after the second or third one, then you know it's air in the system usually, but that's right where it needs to be. I think we still got an issue with that right front wheel hanging up. But that might come out of it, so we'll see. Maybe check some fuses while we got it up in the air. See what else is on the list. I don't know, maybe we'll throw some magic oil into the engine and see if that gets rid of the smoking. I know it's not gonna fix the exhaust. Tighten up our master cylinder cap, put the air cleaner back on it. I'm gonna suck any more rat poop in there. See what happens. That one turns good. 
This, yeah, that's the one that was dragging. We might have to take that one apart and adjust it. I'm betting that's the one that's leaking and the brake shoes are all wet. Usually when those brake shoes get all wet with brake fluid, they like to get all grabby. So this brake drum's stuck. So we gotta get that freed up just so that we can get it apart and assess what's going on in there. I think how we're gonna take it apart is knock the dust cap off. Take the spindle nut off. Before we do that, we gotta get this thing so that it turns. So we got our handy dandy brake adjuster wrench. And where is the adjuster at? Should be either on the top or the bottom. I do not see an adjuster knockout. Awesome. All right, so we got this brake drum off. Turns out didn't need to take the spindle nut off. It actually slid off the hub surprisingly well. A lot of times that doesn't happen. There's our adjuster. Again, there's no way to access it. Looks like somebody maybe put anti-seas on it the last time it was out, so got a chance there that it might turn, but anyway, you can see the shoes are good, but they're where they've been hanging up, they've been grabbing. They're not all wet from the wheel cylinder leaking. But yeah, you can see that rust in the drum too. So I think we're gonna clean that all up and maybe loosen the adjuster up just a hair so that we get a little bit more room for that drum so that it doesn't hang up. We can always come back in and adjust them later. So hopefully cleaning that up, tightening that up gives us a little bit of wiggle room so that these roll freely. All right, so after putting everything back together, cleaning it up, lubing up that adjuster a little bit. And it is a self-adjuster, so it should adjust itself up, but <laughs> turns good-ish. Ow! Put it back together and see what happens. It's gonna be good to go, right, Duff? Duff had to take the door panel apart, and we just kind of bypassed the switch. We got all the windows down, and none of them are working from that switch. So I think we got an issue with the main switch. Let's check over here. Now that we got that, that one's unplugged now, so. It'll go up, but not down. Oh, I guess I never tried the back ones before. Well, we gotta do a little diagnostic work on the winders. Maybe it's just a bad connection. We could probably hook it back up. It'll fix itself. Let's go play some hoops. A little crazy with the booger sugar in the back seat. That stuff's expensive, allegedly. Figure we get the windshield cleaned off for you. Boys and girls out in the old interwebs. Tough, what's it smell like in here? Let's get rid of these fuzzy dice. They are just a bit too obnoxious for me. Yeah, there's a lot of smells in here, I know tough. All right, here she starts. Oh, oh man, our manifold vacuum gauge does not work. So we're back after a year hiatus, just over, and we're gonna start working on this 65 and Palace Super Sport finally. That's right, had a rock auto order sitting on the shelf. I checked the order September 8th. Today is the 28th, so a year and 20 days. We got new radiator hoses, cause it's got a flex hose and we hate those, and they break down over time. We got plugs, cap, rotor, plugs. 
wires, you get it. Wheel cylinders, master cylinder, and hoses. The reason I only do hoses, wheel cylinders, master usually is because they're the only components that have rubber in them and rubber will break down. If we see that the shoes are bad or they're all full of fluid from a leaky wheel cylinder, then I'll put them in. But usually they're just fine. No point in tearing everything apart and going through it. I mean, if this were a thousand point restoration or something that he requested everything gone through, we're not gonna do that. Cause we're still running on, these are probably 25, 30 year old tires. I suggested he replace those, but he's like, I don't know how much money I wanna stick into it. So there's that. We also got some new Walker mufflers and some new tailpipes. Hopefully those fit, cause I hate doing exhaust. So I might go to boom tube for that, or we might borrow a hoist. Or, let's be honest, I'll struggle through it, cause that's what I do. Duff's having breakfast over here, making a bunch of noise. How's that going? Let's get after this thing. Get the front end jacked up. I don't know why I feel like starting on the front, but that's what we're gonna do. Got my wheelie chair out, and I ran through the steps in my mind to see what tools we're gonna need, so I got that prepared. Let's see how many times I can go back and forth with the toolbox. I'm betting it'll be at least five or nine, because no way we got everything in the first shot. That never happens. Doesn't matter how many times you do brakes, there's always something you either forgot or something that hangs you up, but we're gonna give her a whirl. Oh, croil. We're gonna need croil. Got my croil. Let's get after this thing. Super sport time. 327s. Thanks to Florida Man Dave, our battery sponsor this week. He even got you a Florida Man decal so I can remember which one you got. I don't know if that looks like you or not, Dave, but pretty awesome decal. What's it say? Impervious to pain, immune to common sense, the amazing Florida Man. Oh, he's even got socks and sandals. Well, a sock and a sandal. I presume there was one on that foot. So this is why I usually don't order shoes. I mean, look at these things. They're like brand new as far as thickness. They never had any oil from the wheel cylinder run on them. So the adjuster is loose. So there's really no point in replacing those. I mean, it saves you 40, 50 bucks in a bunch of time. So save you some money. So now we'll, uh, Take the brake hose off, take the springs off, take a couple of bolts to hold the wheel cylinder off. Stick a new one of them on. Giving me flashbacks of the two hours I spent on the brake line on the Rambler. tool for taking these clips off. I like a pair of dykes, side cutters, whatever you want to call them. Looks like we're going to have to make our first trip to the toolbox. So this wheel cylinder, usually there's two bolts that come in from the back side that mount these. This one mounts on this big stud in the middle, so we got to get this nut off. So I'm going to need a chisel to knock that tang loose that's holding that hex from turning and also some big sockets to get that off there because I feel like it's bigger than the 7 eighths that I brought up. Yep. Shoot! First trip to the toolbox. Wait, we got a pry bar. It's got an end on it. Well, we still need a socket. We could try rounding it off with a Swedish nut lathe, but we won't. There we go. Of course, there's going to be no Hoover Schneef in these. Oh, a little bit, because these were actually working. 
Our new wheel cylinder looks the same. Our new line threads into it. Should be good to go. No type of thread sealant or thread locker needed on this, seeing so we got that positive lock on there. I'm sure Watch West work would find a torque spec for that, but a couple of Uggaduggas, good enough. Bend that positive lock back over. A little lube on the adjuster wheel. Just for good measure. So that pins back in. Just about forgot our retainer, washer, whatever it's called. Again, watch West work, he would know what that's called because he either looks it all up or he knows everything. I think he just knows everything. Cheese and rice just go on there. So let's stick a thermostat in it. I don't put your thermostat in upside down or it doesn't do thermostatic things. So your spring should always be facing down. Or when the cow dies, it goes udders up. This is your udder. I'm using udder instead of an udder word. So I just remember that. Cow dies, udders up. Now a gasket like this where it's got an adhesive side, put the adhesive on the removable part, like your valve cover or your thermostat housing, whatever it is. So that way you can scrape it off later as opposed to being on the block where it's stuck on there. We take and lay the liner up with the holes, or not. Off for cheese and rice. There. I'm even gonna go clean the threads up on these bolts. How come every time you drop something, we should call that Morsky theory. Anytime you drop something relatively close to a drain pan, it's gonna go in there. Anytime you try to spill something in a drain pan, it's not going to go there. Morsky's Law of Drain Pans. Now I think all we got left up here is plugs and wires. Got our new NGK XR5 V Powers, gapped 35 thousandths. Let's see how the old ones look. Open. Want to bet they're champions? Sure enough, champions. Painted over from when they overhauled it. Pretty sooty. Yeah, definitely getting plenty of fuel. Ooh, that one's a little, a little oily. This side isn't quite as sooty. 
That one is though. Not quite too bad. Oh man. Way too much fuel. So we got all our plugs in, wires are hooked up. These wires are extremely long because they follow around the back of the block and they're supposed to sneak down to the oil pan and then they come up through the engine mount into these front four cylinders. I'm not gonna pull the engine mount to sneak them through. So I just kind of tuck them back in there. We'll zip tie them up. The plug wires that were on here, they had like straight boots and they came way out to the inner fenders and around. But the spark plug wire holders for this thing, they're supposed to be down on the oil pan, are no longer there. So we'll have to tie it up so it doesn't get into the exhaust and burn them off because that would be no bueno. Also, we're going to change oil on it. This thing's got a canister type oil filter for all you young whippersnappers. Basically, it's a canister, you guessed it, that's got this replaceable element in it. And then it comes with that o-ring right there. Duff, what's the tech tip of the day? Grab yourself a hook, tool, o-ring, hook, pliers, screwdriver, a seal pick. That's the word I'm looking for. Words, term. Grab yourself a seal pick and you reach up in there and you get all those old seals out. So otherwise when guys put them up there, they just keep stacking seals. Seven is the record for number of seals that I've seen on an engine block. So you want to make sure you don't double those up because as you know on a spin-on type, when you double them up, it blows oil everywhere. These aren't as bad, but they still make a mess. So here's that canister. There's the filter. And then you can always check in there to see how much trash is in there. This one looks pretty good. And that seal goes around this outside edge of this canister. I've been letting this one drain for a while. Not long enough, apparently. We're gonna dispose of that properly, don't worry. Well, we got our oil drained out, so we'll put that filter back up there, tie up those wires where I'm under there. We're even going to grease it. Yep, Duff says go all out, customer vehicle. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to do the rear brakes. So we got this side wrapped up. Found a new dust cap. Here's how the rear wheel cylinders mount. See how it's got those two bolts going through there? As opposed to that one big kingpin in the middle. Also, I'm an idiot. Thanks, uh, XL Motors Incorporated for, uh, the shirt that I've now christened. Uh, back to me being an idiot. I could have just pulled the drum off that other side. I'm used to working on the super old stuff where you gotta take everything off as an assembly where the hub's like riveted to it. Uh, this side, dust cap was there. We just slid the drum off. Where are you at, drum? Again, looks really good in there. No, Not all grooved up. Brakes weren't all oily. Clean them up a bit. And uh, stuck the wheel cylinder in there. This line was kind of sticky, not as bad as the AMC was, but got her loose, uh, went underneath, greased everything, tied up our plug wires. I think while I got it in the air, well, I got our oil filter on too. Spill proof funnel, uh, I've proven that wrong because that's what I do is spill. New master cylinders on, tune ups pretty much wrapped up up top here, thermostat, radiator hoses. All of that goodness. I think I'm gonna put some new battery cables on it so that they're the right color and that it should be a top post. And I don't like these clamp on ends. And this negative is really short. The battery's not even sitting in the tray, it's slid over. So I think we're gonna at least stick a new ground on and maybe a new end on. I don't know, let's see what we got. Get some new cables while we're at it. But yeah, ready to slam a drum on here. Front brakes are done, go to the backs. Bleed them. We're getting close to taking her for another drive.
brakes are all bled now, thanks to my wonderful assistant. Oh, yep, we're done now. So you can get out of my seat. What? Yeah, I'll get the tires on and then we can go for a ride, maybe. So these mufflers, Paul Walker specials, RIP, direct fit. I think, I don't know what they are. Let me look. Yep, just what Duff said. Offset inlet, offset outlet. So this thing's got some janky glass facts on it. That's right. I don't like glass facts and I don't like white letters. So, wah, wah, wah. Duff doesn't either. Duff pees on them. Let me wheel you on under here. Oh, of course you can't see. So these things are shot. Well, this one for sure. This side isn't much better. Could maybe use a pinion seal, but I checked it. It's full. Yeah, I'm under here telling them how loud it is. We're just going to take it to boom tube because that bracket's loose. This bracket is ancient. She's a little spongy, so could use a couple of brackets. And then those direct fit Paul Walkers are not going to directly fit in here, so I'm guessing he's going to have to do something. So we're going to throw the tailpipes in and uh, have him do it. Because I'm guessing this is custom stuff anyway. Seems how it's got two different step ups and how low it hangs. I don't know, maybe they all hung that low. I just don't like how far down it hangs, but so maybe he can. Well, he probably can't do anything there. He might have to bend that piece up too. I don't know. Whatever. We're putting wheels on it. We're going for a ride to the exhaust shop. Provided it runs. Is it going to run or what? Oh yeah. Put new battery cables on. We got to uh, hook this up. Otherwise it ain't going to crank over. We, I use the solder and heat shrink connectors because I mean they're good and I'm lazy and I don't like soldering. So we'll get that hooked up. Hook the battery cable up. Yeah, we should be able to run her to boom tube. Stay tuned. And then once we get back, sandwich time. Battery must be hooked up. Home light comes on. Let's even got them back there. Ooh, lit right off. Sounds happy under here. That can't be rubbing because it ain't turning. That ain't too tight. You're missing out on all the fun. I wouldn't have went without you.
doing in there? Not on the customer's seats. Well, you guys wanted me to uh, show you how to set points using a dwell meter, and I've never done it. So you guys are gonna learn with me. I did check out some videos on the lube tube. Uh, Uncle Tony's garage, he seems like he knows this stuff. Go check out his channel. And uh, we pulled the old analoscope off the shelf. I've had this thing for, man, 16 years, 15 years. Got it for a case of beer. I don't even know if I was old enough to buy beer at the time, but I was looking at the uh, dates on this thing and it was serviced. The only one that's got a date on it, tag, 90 day guarantee in uh, October 22nd of 1976. So she's a goodie. It's even got the destructions. I don't know if this is going to tell us how to set dwell horizontal. Sh I don't, this is not even a dwell meter. Let's see what this thing does. I don't know. I'm excited. We should probably uh, wipe that off first. You always want to clean your analoscope before uh, implementing it. Oh my. Somebody's probably screaming that this thing's worth tens of dollars and I shouldn't be cleaning it this way because I'm scratching the lenses. Primary patterns, secondary. Oh, there we go. Two to four dwell. One, two points. I have no idea. Six spark plugs. We should just probably find a regular dwell meter and not use this thing. But I like saying analoscope, so yeah, we're going to have to read the destructions. MT615. Well, 12 volt, that's what we got for sure. I don't know about the rest. Battery ground, negative. Polarity, load. We could hook a timing light up to it if we had one. All right, destruction manual time. So we're uh, kind of winging it here. Oh, check this dude out. Where's he at? The tune-up procedure. No, nope, not that guy. Here's the uh, sheets you fill out every time you do one. Quite a few left. And then, where is that guy? Oh, this is for the dwell meter. Look at that dude. With his birth control putting glasses on there. He's working on like a 70 to 73 Camaro though. So this thing isn't as old as I thought. I think it's got the specs in here for, I have to clean the dust off. Like up to 74? Come on. Anyway. I'm guessing it's like a 74.5 model. I don't know what this green dot does, but when I wipe the screen off, it moves around. Hopefully you guys can pick that up. And you can't really read it, but degrees of dwell is right there. We want between 28 and 32, ideally 30, which is right there. Six spark, I don't, I don't know what any of this means. We're gonna have to do some more reading, but. So we got power hooked up. It says you can hook that up to the coil, but you gotta have it hooked up for the ballast resistor since this thing's pretty much all points have ballast resistors. As far as I know, there's probably some that don't. Uh, we just hooked it up power, ground, negative side of the coil. And then we had to hook up into the number one spark plug wire or just any spark plug wire the way I'm doing it. Then we got our loser switch hooked up. Duff even came out of hibernation to check it out. Watch this, how neat is this? Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Dang. It's like our own little game of Pong. So we got that going for us. Now I'm gonna keep playing around and figuring out what we're supposed to do next. Exciting times, aren't they, Duff?
She don't run too bad. She's still smoking pretty bad out of that left bank. Definitely needs some attention. Carburetor needs a little bit of work, but that's pretty much as far as we're gonna take it. On this project, unfortunately, um, yeah, we just don't have time to put an engine in it. I told them they should probably get some new tires because these things are pretty dated and I'd sure hate to see somebody lose a tire and either wreck the car or wad up a quarter panel, something like that. So yeah, I did a little more research in the uh, old analoscope. You don't set dwell with it, but you can do all kinds of other stuff with it. So this shows you how to connect it. Uh, you can either run it off 120 volt or 12 volt. You hook uh, one wire to the ground, one wire to the power on the battery, one wire to the ground side of the coil, and then you got your one wire under your spark plug. So here's some of the stuff that you can do with this thing. You can set your ignition timing if you've got the timing light, which we don't have. Ignition reserve tests, coil polarity. So we talked about this in the Buck and Bronco video. Check that out if you haven't. Wrong polarity has the effect of making the ignition system fight against itself. It actually induces, reduces, it actually reduces the voltage available at the spark plugs by as much as 40% because electrons normally move from a hot object, the center of the electrode of the spark plug, to a cold object at a lower voltage, the other spark plug electrode. So, there you go. It's, uh, when you hook your coil up backwards, it's going to, uh, reduce your voltage available by 40%. Now you know, this is according to Snap-on in 1974, I think. Uh, you can measure battery to coil resistance, point closing faults, coil to ground resistance. I think there was point opening faults. Yep, there it is. Condenser faults, primary circuit leakage. Basically all these, you look at this graph and, and it seems like a pain because you got to look for these little waves and blips and I don't know seems like a class I took in college that I don't want to do ever again distributor wear this would actually be a good one um, if you this is a good distributor and you can see how it kind of dips down here if you got a worn distributor shaft pretty neat point balance and then it's got like some weird notes in here like Buick V6 wear pattern um, valve action if you got a sticky exhaust or intake valve Spark plug action, secondary circuit leakage, secondary circuit resistance. I mean, you could do a lot of stuff with this thing. This is basically like your OBD2 code reader, what you got now, but it'd be uh, one smart cookie to use it. Uh, that's an adapter that we don't have. Um, then, it, yeah, 72 to 74 Chrysler electronic ignition system. So this is like the beginning of electronic ignition. You could do some stuff in here. Uh, GM capacitive discharge, Pontiac, HEI, just a bunch of weird stuff. Porsches with CD ignition, 73 Audi, Mazda rotaries. Oh, if we ever get a 392 Hemi with a Magneto, we can test those. It's just all kinds of neat stuff you can do in here. Gives you all the firing orders of all the stuff back then, like I said, they, they stop at 74 on most of this stuff. So I'm guessing it's a 74, 75 model. And then locations of the cylinders on the vehicles. Cam angle specs. Then you can do some other stuff um, if you've got the right attachments. Primary voltage test. Uh, voltage regulator. Doing dwell, but of course we're missing the uh, dwell adapter thinger. This guy, the primary tack dwell meter. We got the instructions for it. And I remember seeing one of these around. I think my dad's got one. So that's what we need. So you guys are gonna have to wait to get a, a points dwell setting. So basically what you're doing with a dwell meter is you're setting your points gap, uh, which is your dwell angle to 30 degrees as opposed to, you know, sliding a matchbooks through it. You're doing a little bit more precise job with the dwell meter. You're, getting her nailed right on. So uh, we'll have to pick one of those up. Thought I had one around here, I do somewhere, but I just can't find it. But like I said, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up on this 65 Impala Super Sport. It's way too nice of a car for us, right Duff? Because he doesn't get to ride in it. So 
we're gonna send this one back to the customer and we're done taking on customer stuff because uh, as you can tell this video is kind of all over the place trying to work on this thing in between my own stuff and that square body customer project and everything else going on so glad to see it go hate to see you leave but love to watch it go is that how it goes I don't know anyway appreciate it thank you very much check out my other videos Consider joining the Duff Approved membership down below. We got a Patreon account if you want to support the channel. Apparel, get your uh, Mortski Repair apparel. Click the link down below. I like the Next Level shirts, even though it's kind of getting to be uh, flannel season, as you can see right now. We don't have a flannel yet. We'll have to work on that. Remember, doesn't matter how you get it done, as long as you're having fun. This thing would be a fun car. Man, that sun is different tonight, huh, Duff? All right, back to working on junk. No more nice stuff, right? More junk. Of course, looking for stuff for the next project. What do I find? The Actron dual meter. Next time, I promise. Not on this one, because it doesn't have points. Yeah, I know, don't be so disappointed. Got you more casseroles though.